So I'm hoping this morning you have come in feeling pretty happy. Because happiness ultimately is a feeling. It's a feeling of pleasure, a feeling of enjoyment. And it is so good to feel happy, right? Happiness for me is, I'm quite a simple girl really, Uh, happiness for me is like my first coffee of the morning. I literally can't function without my first coffee of the morning. And my husband and I, we don't have a posh coffee maker or anything like that, but I do like a cafetiere. So we have a cafetiere and that coffee is honestly like my favourite thing, it does make me very happy. The better coffee is this church coffee, so if you have not tried the church coffee, it's honestly amazing. I also love what other things that make me happy are also adventures out with my family. I've got two children and a husband and a dog. We're an outdoorsy family, so I like going out. So especially when we're going out and about on big adventurous walks, exploring, kids are behaving, husband's in a happy place, makes me happy. I also asked some of the guys in our church, what makes you happy? Some of you might remember this when I stuck it out on our Facebook group. And we had some interesting responses. We had um, one guy, whether you're a football fan or not, a Leicester City win makes him happy. If you're a foodie, um, we had steak makes someone happy, chocolate makes someone happy. Um, Interestingly, I don't know which camp you're in, but we had, um, I think it was the pastor of our church or the lead elder of our church said the first day of spring and summer makes him happy because he likes the warmth. Whether, and then one of the other eldership, one of the other leaders of the church was completely the opposite. And I was like, no, I'm autumn, winter. I don't like the heat. What makes me happy is the cold. So it's quite interesting. But the thing is, is that happiness is circumstantial, isn't it? We don't feel happy all the time. Our happiness is often based on events or moments in time. It's kind of a temporary feeling. And so our days generally, I would say, are kind of mixed with ebbs and flows of feelings. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're frustrated, and we kind of go about the day. And actually, the Bible says that we're never promised um, a joy-filled, happy life. Like, once you become a Christian, and once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't mean that everything suddenly is happy and rosy and everything's perfect. In fact, scripture says that we will face difficulties and trials. But what scripture does say is that we can be filled with joy. We can be filled with joy and peace despite our circumstances. So I think the question here now is, is how is joy different? And this is what we want to explore today. As women of faith, you know, you might have been a Christian for years and years and years. You might be here just exploring and finding out a little bit more about it. But the theme today is living life joyfully. How do we live life joyfully when life can be quite sporadic? So I'm just going to quickly pray before I bring the message and the word of God now. So Lord, I just pray that Lord, as I speak your word, that Lord, we would have open ears. I believe, Lord, we have been praying as a church so much that we believe that today is about revelation moments, transformation moments, that Lord, you want to do what only you can do. So Lord, I pray that we would receive what you want us to receive, whether that's in worship, the word, in prayer. But Lord, we just give all of these women to you. I just pray that we would hear what you want us to hear and that we would respond in Jesus' name. Okay, good. So the beauty, of course, about the Bible is that it's filled with stories and promises and wisdom. So we can glean on this, can't we? It's an old book, but there is a lot of wisdom in there. And in today's message, I want to share with you a bit about Peter, who was one of Jesus' disciples. Like us and many of the stories in the Bible, Peter didn't experience everyday happiness. But he did walk with Jesus in his ministry pretty much all the way through. Peter experienced difficult times. 
Yet despite the mess, he clung to Jesus and Jesus ended up using him powerfully and restored him. And I believe this morning that is, that is what he wants for us. Through Peter's relationship with Jesus, he grew, and through this growth, he discovered the fullness of joy. He discovered the fullness of joy of following Jesus and the abundant life that Jesus had for him and that he has for each one of us. I think many of us will identify with some of the feelings that Peter felt as he journeyed with Jesus even now. And so we're just going to explore three stories about Peter together and look at that in a bit more detail, okay? So the first story that I want to tell you about Peter, and you might be familiar with this, is of course when Jesus fed the 5,000, one of the amazing miracles where Jesus went out and... Um, managed to pass around lots of bread and fish to all these people so that everybody was fed. Now, after Jesus had done that, he was obviously very tired and wanted to spend time with the Lord. So it says that he went up to the mountain to pray. And um, when he did this, the disciples, including Peter, took a boat out onto the lake and went out to the other side of the lake. And it says that when evening came, Jesus could see the disciples were having a difficult time because the lake was just, the wind was picking up, the waves were getting higher, the storm was getting fierce. It was a little bit dicey, to say the least. So Jesus, being Jesus, walked on the water over to them. As you can imagine, the disciples had never seen anything like this before. So as the disciples saw Peter, Jesus walking on, them to, on the water to them, they got really scared. And they thought that he was a ghost. But Jesus said to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, well, if it's you, then can I walk on the water with you? And Jesus said, yeah, okay then, come on. So he started to walk on the water. <laughs> Now, the wind started picking up, the storm continued to get quite fierce, and Peter, of course, became afraid. And as he became afraid, fear took over, and he began to sink. And he said to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and said, O oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt? How many times in our life have we doubted Jesus despite knowing that he is right there with us? We know it, we believe it, but sometimes fear and worry and anxiety just takes over, doesn't it? Seeds of doubt begin to scatter, and if seeds of doubt began to scatter, they begin to grow. Honestly, I am a complete and utter victim of this. I worry. I am a worrier. And this is the one story that really does actually resonate with me. Sometimes, whether we have come here maybe this morning and there's worry or anxious thoughts deep down where we're um, worried about finances. I mean, goodness sake, the news is just, it's just worrying full stop, isn't it? Maybe you've come here today and you know that a loved one that's really poorly. Maybe there's issues with family or friends or there's just something in your world that just makes you worry. And actually, that anxiety is just sitting on you and it's weighing you down. And it's hard to feel joy and peace when we are consumed with those anxious thoughts. My second example is the time when Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray. Jesus knew that his time had nearly come, and he knew what was coming. He knew that the cross was before him. And he told the disciples who were his friends, including Peter, how worried he was. And after some time, he said to them, look, I really need to pray. I need to spend time with God. Please, would you 
would you um, keep watch overnight while I'm praying? And he trusted them to do that. So Jesus went off and started praying, trusting that his friends are watching out for anyone coming. And when Jesus looks up, he sees that they're all asleep, including Peter. And he says to them, why are you asleep? Couldn't you just stay awake for one hour while I was just praying? The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. This happened three times during the course of the night when Jesus was trying to pray. And eventually Jesus says to them, come on then, let's rise and go. And they leave. In the Bible, it says to us that Peter and the disciples, their eyes were tired. They were sleepy. They wanted to go to sleep. It was night time. And it got me thinking, you know, there's sleepy tired and then there's weary tired. We can grow weary. And when we're weary, when we're tired, when we're exhausted, whether it's stress, whether it's busyness, whether it's loneliness. The temptation is to just drift and become complacent sometimes, I think, as well. We end up just drifting and trudging along, getting along, getting on with our day-to-day business, just plodding along, getting on with it. Yep, tick, that one's, you know, managed to get through that day, great. But in that, in that busyness, In that distraction, our mindsets and attitudes and our choices might become distracted and sometimes quite selfish, really, because it's all about us. Our eyes are no longer fixed on Jesus and his will for our lives, but instead it's fixed more on ourselves and everything else in our world. Prayer life goes out the window. I'm too busy for that. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I haven't got time for prayer. And it is hard to know joy when, A, we are weary, distracted, and complacent, but also, B, when we don't spend any time with Jesus. My husband was telling me a story the other day, or reminded me of a story the other day, when he was really struggling with his job. And he felt so consumed in his job. He was so weary. He was exhausted. He didn't know which way to turn. He didn't have time. Well, he felt like he didn't have time to regularly pray because he was just immersed in it. And he was tired. He looked a bit grey as well. He won't mind me telling me that. But he said to me, he remembers that when he chose to spend time with the Lord... There was one time when the Lord said to him, very clearly, no matter how hard you try in your own strength, the hour you spend in prayer today is worth a thousand hours of trying to sort it out. So true, isn't it? Sometimes we just need to be still and spend time with Jesus. And just my third and final story about Peter was when Jesus was actually arrested at this point and he was led away. Sorry, I'm getting tangled up. (laughs) He was arrested and, um, and led away. And we read in scripture that Peter was following Jesus when he was arrested. But he was keeping himself at a distance because he didn't want to be associated with Jesus because he was worried about what might happen to him. So he kept himself at a distance. And when he got to the courtyard near to where they'd taken Jesus, he saw a group of people surrounded by... um, Surrounded by a fire, is that the right expression? Uh, By a fire trying to keep warm. And um, he just kind of like huddled on in, sat in between them and just sort of kept his head down and was just trying to check if Jesus was okay, I think. And suddenly a servant girl turned around and said, I recognize you. You were with Jesus. And of course, Peter denied it. Second time, somebody else a little time later said, I recognize you. You've been with Jesus. You're Jesus' friend. And he went, no, 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 I'm not. That wasn't me. And then about an hour later, 
It said someone else said, yes, yesterday you were with Jesus. I've seen you before. And of course, Peter, for the third time, denied it. And if you know the story, you know that at that point, the cock crowed and Peter realized what he'd done because Jesus had predicted what was going to happen. He'd already told Peter and the disciples that this would happen. And Peter had a recollection of that moment and felt awful. He felt so much shame that he'd lied three times, that he took himself away and wept. He felt guilty. He felt full of shame. He knew he'd lied, not once, not twice, but three times. But the interesting thing here is that Jesus knew. Because let's be honest, before we mess up, before we make mistakes, before we fail, Jesus already knows that you're going to do that. And isn't this an area where we can be robbed of our joy? We can be robbed of our joy in our own mess ups. We can be robbed of our joy in our own mistakes. We can be robbed of our joy in our guilt and our shame that we carry in the lies. All this stuff could have happened years and years and years and years ago. But it still burdens and weighs us down because we feel guilty. We might be so good, you know, at putting on a brave face, coming in here sticking on your happy, brave face. But actually, deep down, there's a hole. And we want to have inner joy, and we want to have inner peace. But you wonder, how do I get that? Because instead of joy, you just feel a deep sorrow. The reason I wanted to share these three stories with you about Peter is because I believe that there's an eclectic mix of feelings here. And I believe that one or two or maybe more of those (laughs) resonate with you somewhere. Peter went through trials and tests. Peter understood fear and worry. Peter made mistakes and he messed up. Peter got distracted. He got weary. He was complacent. He experienced unhappiness. He wasn't happy all the time. His life went through ebbs and flows just like ours of happiness and unhappiness. But the thing is, is that Peter never let go of Jesus. And Jesus never let go of him. In fact, Peter's relationship with Jesus grew consistently because he remained in the presence of Jesus He kept moving forwards with Jesus, no matter what mistakes, mess-ups, fear, worry. He didn't move backwards. He kept moving forwards with Jesus. He journeyed with Jesus, and he knew Jesus loved him. He maintained a consistent relationship with Jesus because he knew that Jesus loved him no matter what, that he looked after him, that he cared for him, that he directed his steps, and also that Jesus saw his potential. Just like he does with you. Jesus is not a temporary feeling. He's not going anywhere. He's constant. He's everlasting and he's eternal. So no matter how we're feeling, what situation we're in, what circumstance we're in, it doesn't matter. We get to have an everlasting relationship with Jesus. He is where the joy is. You know, the enemy would absolutely love to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said that. The enemy would love to kill, steal, and destroy. And that sounds a bit like scary. But the thing, what it means is, is that the enemy would love you to not be able to move forward from where you are at right now. He would love to kill your dreams, kill your beliefs, kill your joy. He wants you to dwell in your mistakes, 
dwell in your complacency, in your fears, in your worries, in your mess-ups, and sit there and never move forward. But Jesus, straight after he said that, in John 10, 10, he said, but I have come to give you abundant life, life to the full. With Jesus, we get to grow spiritual fruit. When we've been praying as a team, we've been talking so much about spiritual fruit. And it basically means in all of our stuff, we can learn and grow in our trials and in our hard times, in our mess ups, in our mistakes, in our choices, in our attitudes, in all the stuff that holds us back. And Peter is such a good example of this. Because after Jesus' resurrection, so Jesus died on the cross, but then he rose into heaven, and then he came back down to earth, and then he ascended into heaven again, once and for all. And after that, he left us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, which resides in us, meaning he is with us all the time. And Peter... Because of this, he became a bold and brave and mighty speaker for the Lord all over the place. He was supernaturally filled up with the Spirit so that no matter what circumstance or situation he faced, he was full of joy. In his first ever message he spoke, which we can read in Acts 2. He chooses to speak part of Psalm 16 over all those who were there. I'm just going to ask the worship team to just start to come up now. But this psalm was a beautiful song written by David years and years and years ago before um, Jesus was born. When God had told David all about the resurrection of Jesus... And declaring the hope and joy that we can only find in the presence of the Lord. The Psalm 16 is known as a golden psalm, a precious psalm, because it tells us years before Jesus was even born what was going to happen and who Jesus was. This psalm is a powerful declaration. It's a powerful declaration that can speak to us too, because it's full of truth. When our hope and trust is in Jesus, we can have a fullness of joy. And just like Jesus, just like Jesus, he said to Peter right at the beginning, when he asked Peter to be one of his disciples, he said, come and follow me. And Peter did. And I believe that he says this to each and every one of us today. There's a reason why you're here. There is a reason why you're here. He wants more of you. And he says, come and follow me. No matter how you're feeling, what your circumstances, what your situation is, I love you. So what I want to do is, because with this psalm, It's one when I was asking the Lord for Jewel, what do you want me to speak about? This is the psalm. This is the um, piece that the Lord really drew me to. When Peter declared it over all the people in Jerusalem at Pentecost, but also David prophesied it, prophesied over it way before Jesus was born. Now, it should be up on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin my prayer with this psalm. But I'm going to use it as a declaration of joy and hope over every single one of us as well. And what I want to encourage you to do, I know it's the beginning of the day-ish. And I know it's kind of early days and people are just getting into it. But I think if anything has resonated with you... Declare this over yourselves, whether you want to speak it out with me, whether you want to just sit still and speak it into your heart, that is up to you. But this psalm is a psalm of truth, of hope, and of joy. I saw the Lord always before me. 
because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me. To the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Lord, we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you did on that cross for us. We love you, Lord. We know that you already know our mess-ups and our mistakes. We know that you already know our worries and our anxieties. You know where we are feeling distracted and complacent. But you still love us. And so, Lord, we give you what we need to give you this morning. We open our hearts up to you right now, because you can hear us. We might not be speaking out loud, but you know what we're thinking. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak back to us, because it says in the word, as we draw close to you, you draw close to us. So we invite you, Jesus, now to just minister to us, to just speak to us. It might be that we just want to spend a bit of quiet time now, just resting in you. It might be that we just want to have somebody to come alongside us and pray with us. And if you do, I'll be at the back. I know some of the prayer team will be at the back. If you want to just stick your hand up, it's up to you. But I just pray that if you feel like Jesus is talking, respond. He is good. He loves you. He is not going to scare you. He's not going to take you out of your comfort zone. He loves you. Let's just rest in that now. But if you do want prayer, please speak to one of the prayer team. Head to the back. Put your hand up. The prayer team will see you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.